Hello, welcome to our look ahead to what the papers will be bringing us tomorrow. With us are Tom Chivers from the Daily Telegraph, the theologian and writer Vicky Beachy. Front pages then, let's make a start with the Telegraph and uh, most of the papers are leading with the Malaysia Airlines plane crash and the Telegraph's headline says that the families of the victims fear that pro-Russia rebels may keep the bodies as a bargaining chip. The picture also has, uh, a, sorry, the paper also has a picture of Rory McElroy's win at the Open Championship. The MH17 crash is also the top story in The Guardian. The other story making its front page is Gaza facing its heaviest day of Israeli shelling. The Independent's focusing on the UK and US leading calls for tougher sanctions against Russia. A similar line in the FT, which says Western leaders are handing an ultimatum to President Putin over its role in Ukraine. Also in the mail, Prime Minister David Cameron threatening to freeze Russian assets. The Times has an American intelligence report claiming Moscow sent rocket launchers to the separatists in Ukraine. What have you got to hide, Mr. Putin, is the headline on the Mirror's front page, with a picture of a black box being taken away from the crash site. A different story on the Express, new pension rules expected to benefit millions of people in Britain. Well, we seem to have flushed out quite a bit of uh, comment on uh, social media tonight, don't we, on Twitter, <laughs> uh, suggesting that maybe... People aren't coming down, you know, on one side or another when it comes to certain stories. So we'll, we'll try and correct that. But mm. it's difficult, isn't it, with some of these stories because um, you're accused of bias one way or the other. Let's start with uh, the uh, aftermath of the Malaysia Airlines plane. The Times. Damning US intelligence puts Russia in the dark. World is watching you, Cameron warns Putin. It's, they had a rather tense half hour phone call. Uh, Russia sent powerful rocket launchers to the separatists that shot down a plane. Um, then they allowed. Russia allowed separatist fighters to receive training inside Russia and then the suggestion that uh, the uh, equipment that they used was hurriedly mm. taken back to Russia. Um, so, so we've got intelligence from America saying Russia was at fault. That, that's probably not a surprise though, is it? No, well uh, John Kerry's been very, very strong on this and coming up with this evidence to say that these um, three um, you know, surface-to-air missile carriers were hurriedly put back across the border um, at night uh, very, very soon after, within hours, it says, of the incident on Thursday. So these things are beginning to come to light and I think just fueling the anger that people are feeling and uh, fueling the desire for justice. Well, it's the obvious sort of air of something to hide about it. I mean, when, when, sort of when you've smuggled your missile units back over a border, yeah. there's a sort of... It sort of doesn't doesn't scream innocence to me. It doesn't scream. You know, they sort of immediately Talk after cloak and dagger, you know, isn't it? Exactly. Like just trying to clean up and, all and the evidence. Keeping, keeping the uh, well, as you see on the front of another paper, see, there's the keep keeping hold of the black boxes and hiding them away. This mm. doesn't. This isn't the action of an innocent man. I don't think. I think we, it looks all fingers point to Russia a bit. Mm. At the well, the difficulty is the investigators, uh, the from the OSCE, need to get unfettered access to the site, don't they? And it's a very difficult area to, to be working in. They haven't had all the access that they want. Uh, but then again, you've got European monitors in eastern Ukraine, which is un, which is rebel held. You've got two mm. very different sets of interests, haven't you, competing here? Absolutely. Space. I think when it comes to a, a tragedy of this kind of international magnitude, those kind of independent reviewers have to be able to come in and assess the situation. And I'm glad that Cameron's really, really pushing for that, saying that that has to happen, that Putin has mm. to allow uh, what they're saying is unfettered access just to get in there and figure out what happened. And that, that's what these, these loved ones deserve. And the, 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 the very human uh, bit of the story, which we mustn't overlook, is irrespective of what else might be found at the crash site, there are still up to 100 bodies They're on that around. site. Some of them are still strapped to their chairs. Yeah. Well, and hopefully they would have found some more today. I know they had cranes coming in to yeah. lift up some of the fuselage so they could hopefully find some of those um, other missing bodies. But yeah, as you say, they've had 300-ish on the plane. They found around 200, so yeah. we, we need to account for those 100 for but the sake of those who are wondering if people are, you know were on board or not. Let's move on to the Daily Mail. Uh, PM will freeze Russian billions. Furious Cameron warns Putin over the jet outrage and tells him you've contributed to an appalling tragedy. I mean, the suggestion that this, this phone call ne didn't necessarily have uh, make much of a dent on President Putin today. Mm. I mean, again, we're only getting it from... We're getting the Downing Street end of it, aren't we? Well, the... Uh there is exactly that. There's a sort of... There's a, it's Cameron slightly playing the big man here and saying... Look, look, you know, we're, we'll we'll come down hard on you. Although you'll notice in his um, Sunday Times piece today that he was very careful to put a line and say, of course we wouldn't go to war with them. You know, they, 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 he knows 
how far how you can far go you with can this. You can, you can, you can, they can slap wrists and they can they can freeze assets, but they, they, there's nothing that much they can do. But what is interesting, I thought, was about this stuff is that they're using the word cronies. I know Philip Hammond used the word crony of, uh, about the people around um, Putin, and that is a word that has real almost criminal overtones to me. That is that, that, that is a word. Negative that, word yeah, exactly. It's a, yeah. it's a word you use to describe mafiosi and that sort of thing. So I th th there is definitely been a stepping up of rhetoric, at least. And, uh, and what good it will do, I don't know. But Something's got to be done there, hasn't it? I think all the pressure that's on Putin seems to be coming to nothing. So if they can go after the people that are in his inner circle that are going to give him hassle day in, day out, uh, and really hurt them in ways that are going to kind of, yeah. you know, really kind of make a financial impact on them and restrict their travel and restrict their investments, it, something's got to be done. This seems like a, a good sort of... Yeah. Good well, course of action. Nerve to go through with it, of course, is the next question. Mm. The Daily Mirror, what have you got to hide, Mr. Putin, as bodies are dragged from the scene and put into trains, stuffed into trains, uh, and black boxes mm. are spirited away? That's what the world is asking, according to the Mirror. I mean, there's so much uh, evidence that needs to be collected from that uh, crash site, but uh, already there are sanctions which are biting fairly hard, aren't they, because mm. of what happened in Crimea. Uh, and this is just going to add to the, the economic yeah. squeeze, which is affecting yeah. sort of currency exchange rates, which affects yeah. business. And, and Cameron, again, made, makes the point that we, the, the West often acts as though it needs Russia more than Russia needs it, you know, that because we rely so heavily on their investment and their, their energy. But there we are, there are more, there are more, the, the Western economy is bigger than the Russian economy. So we should be able to apply these sanctions if the Russian leaders think in the same way as we do. The um, other thing that was interesting is that John Kerry has, uh, as you were saying, John Kerry's mm. said this is pretty, but he, as he says, the lack of access makes its own statement about the culpability and responsibility of it Russia. Does, they won't yeah. let people in there. Yeah. And that's very much the same, that's, yeah. that's diplomatic language for what have you got to hide, Mr. Mm. Putin. So the more they ask this kind of question, the more he'll have to step back. So also the Russian response, I think, in Russian media is very interesting. They already had kind of pre-made, uh, very detailed explanations about, you know, other causation for these things mm. that it just felt a little bit kind of propaganda-esque that they already had all these answers and these um, apparently pieces on their news channels that mm. are that were very very quickly ready to explain all the different options that it wasn't them and it was you know yeah. it just looked quite suspicious and like we're never subject to propaganda are we? <laughs> <laughs> never uh, the guardian move on to gaza which is the other story i mean if it hadn't been for this crash this the gaza story would be lead on everything wouldn't it so this is the most extraordinary week it what? feels to me um gaza's bloodiest day at least 87 palestinians killed we also know 13 um, soldiers uh, from the israeli side killed overnight mm. Mm. just an absolutely heartbreaking week it's just incredible to, to switch on the news and just see graphic image after graphic image of places around the world where these heartbreaking things are happening. So I agree with you. I think this would have been front and centre had we not had the crash. But, yeah, just tragic um, that these Palestinians are killed. 75% of the Palestinians killed um, have been civilians so far. And that is uh, it's really interesting. I mean, Israel initially was starting on the, the edges to, to take these Hamas tunnels, but now they've very much moved into civilian areas with sort of indiscriminate fire which means so many innocent people are losing their lives. But Benjamin, we... Benjamin Netanyahu is saying that they do give warnings, they tell them to get out of the way. And pamphlets uh, and text messages. I suppose in, such a pla in a place that is so densely mm. populated, overpopulated, you could say, where, where do you go yeah, to, exactly. where do you hide? Now you can evacuate to next door, I don't know. I mean, yeah. we all got told off by, on Twitter for being for sitting on the fence about this too much, but I just, I, <laughs> my honest opinion is it's too complicated too, to pick a... Too. To pick, to pick sides in an easy way, but it's maybe. just tragic and complex. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's look at the let's said. look at how the FT is looking at it. There's an uh, under attack a picture there of a, a little boy being carried by a policeman uh, into a hospital in Gaza. He had been wounded in the shelling. Palestinian death toll soars in Israeli assault. I don't think we can show you the picture very very readily. It's probably unusable. Um, I don't know if I even know. I can hold it up to camera two. I'll hold it there and see if you can see it. There you are. The old school way still works yeah. sometimes, doesn't it? No um, but you just wonder where this is going to end. The, mm. the Israelis have said it's limited in scope, mm. uh, but it's ferocious while yeah. it lasts. Well, it's already the, the, most, the bloodiest day from Israel's point of view in uh, how many, t 10 years or something like that. It's, it's obviously could go as, as far as people want it to go, and it's just uh, a question of how, how, side, how, how quickly the two sides sort of... Um, Political pressures will allow them to set, step back before you know. Yeah. Well, Israel must be counting the cost. I mean, in their 2008 sure. three-week um, military combat, they they didn't lose as many people as they have here in in their 13 that have fallen. So, but 13 they compared will... with 400 and odd, it's oh absolutely. You know, you but I mean, in terms yes. of Israel kind of reassessing versus mm. 2008, I think they this will really have hit them hard. Mm. Let's move on to the Telegraph.
Recovery passes the pre-crisis peak at last. This will be music to the ears of those in the uh, exchequer. Britain's economy has finally recovered from the blow it suffered after the financial crisis of 2008. And uh, output has actually surpassed the peak we saw back in that year, according to the chief economic advisor at a forecasting group, the uh, uh, Ernst & Young Item Club. Uh, this will be very handy for politicians in the coalition won't it absolutely and they're protest. already saying that the coalition's own figures do kind of back this up of course as they would um, but uh, what it's actually saying is that predictions we out will be out on friday from the office of national statistics so it's really just about how much weight we give these predictions and my take on it is that unless the average person is really feeling this you can't declare that the recession is over unless it's kind of made its way into real life so i mean i think this is, this is good news, but I don't think people are really going to believe it or trust it until they actually feel the impact on their own bank account. It's that confidence thing, isn't yeah. it? Well, it's nice to see the mighty Ken Clark hasn't kept his head down for long as well. The other down say, saying, you know, there might be a recovery, but it's not balanced enough. It's always that classic thing, you know, it's not enough manufacturing. The actual the, the economy is too weighted on the London um, financial services and not enough on us actually making stuff. You know, um, so uh, for, from purely sort of personal point of view, it's nice to see Ken Clark is still making trouble for the government even when he's not in it. But um, also, I think he, he may well be right that it's just a lot of uh, people sort of shifting money around in different places, in different places mm. of Canary Wharf, rather than actually uh, building stuff in the economy. This is interesting. So employment growth was being driven by older workers retiring later, which we know they've got to because they, they can't afford to retire. Um, a benefit claimants coming off welfare, which is if they're going into work and they're getting, mm -hmm. you know, a decent-ish wage, um, surely that's meant to be a good thing. Mm. Um, and new immigrants, again, mm. and that's... It's very interesting. That's isn't very it? interesting, yeah. isn't yeah. it? That that's not what we necessarily yeah. would hear reported. Well, there was a great yeah. line in a, um, conser a Conservative press release the other day saying that more people are in work than ever before. And what they didn't say, of course, is there are more people than ever before. You know, this, this, the top-line statistic is not always mm. as useful as you think it is. There's always a little bit beneath it. Is it part-time work? Is it yeah. mm. zero hours contracts? Yeah. Is it yeah. minimum exactly. wage? It's great immigration portrayed in a positive light. That's something that I'm very passionate about. The, the, the real you know brilliant stuff that immigrants bring to our country and uh, mm. I think things like that deserve to be um, yeah, emboldened you know easily miss <laughs> rather that. than like yeah. last yeah. You know, almost last second to last paragraph says. yeah uh, I love this last story we're going to finish on there's not a lot of light relief around so I hope you'll um, bear with us while we give this a, a little airing Stone's hot stuff is a box set. After 50 years of sex, drugs and rock and roll, it appears that age may finally be catching up with the Rolling Stones because apparently what they do in their evenings when they're on tour and even at home, uh, Ronnie Wood completes jigsaw puzzles and watches box sets of... Uh, oh, you, can't, you can't see it. I think you're going to struggle. But anyway, it's just here. There's a tiny picture mm. of Ronnie Wood and Mick it. Jagger. Not no. Not expect at all. It says that they, when they all hang out together, they work their way through puzzles and box sets and you just sort of think about the the other extreme of what you imagine with the kind of sex drugs and rock and roll and I just think it's really heartening to imagine them all sitting watching apparently House of Cards, Game of Thrones, I know. Uh, Breaking and, Bad. That's and what Ronnie Wood's wife organises backgammon competitions for them. They clearly they've already done all the drugs and drunk all the drink. They just <laughs> <laughs> okay we, we can stop They're now. They're so over that. They're <laughs> yeah, like the so exactly. last season yeah. we've moved on to puzzles. Yeah. Do you know I could, could even I could keep up with them in a the backgammon competition. <laughs> mm. Backgammon's great. I didn't know anyone did jigsaws anymore. This is, this is mm. amazing. Maybe one day I too will be... I, I gave them up when my kids were toddlers and that was the last time I ever did one. That's it for the papers tonight. Vicky, Tom, thank you very much for coming in and talking us through the front pages. It's uh, heavy going, isn't it, Always at times at the moment? Yeah. Thank you very much. Coming up next, here on BBC News, the film review.